G'day everyone, welcome back to the channel. So in today's video, I want to talk to you guys about what I'm finding clinically about patellar tendonitis or knee tendonitis or jumper's knee as we tend to call it. Um, so what I want to go through in the video is I want to talk to you guys about what I'm finding to be the hidden underlying and, and probably overlooked cause of knee tendonitis and then follow that up with two really simple exercises to help you address some of the things that I don't think we're really looking at a lot in the industry. And if you're someone who's had knee tendonitis for a long time, maybe you're struggling to shake it, um, or you've got it and it's really painful and it's stopping you doing what you want to do, I'd strongly urge you to either have these things looked at or start doing them yourself and see what it starts to do to your symptoms um, in the short term and over a long period of time going forward. So, <clears throat> so basically what I want to talk about, I have a real issue in the industry when we label an injury an overuse injury. Uh, mainly because I don't think it does a good enough job of explaining exactly why one specific part of your body has become a problem um, and others have not. So ideally, when we talk about patellar tendonitis, we say, look, that patellar tendon that attaches from the base of the kneecap to the top of the shin, if you're jumping a lot, if you're jumping and landing a lot, there's a lot of load that's going through those tendons. So it makes sense that over time, they might start to become dysfunctional if the load is too much and and there's other, other factors that come into play. But the problem that I see a lot is that for a lot of people, patellar tendonitis is often on the one knee. If not both knees, it's worse on one side. Now, we can certainly mount a bunch of explanations as to why we think that might be. But if something's truly overuse, using it alone shouldn't be a recipe for disaster because we know that use and overuse breeds greater skill acquisition, greater strength, greater endurance. Using tissue alone shouldn't be a valid reason for causing dysfunction unless it's exposing something that's already there underneath the surface that we're not considering. And that's what I want to talk about today with, uh, with knee tendonitis. So, <clears throat> so clinically what I'm finding is that as strange as this sounds, the mid to low back seems to have a really strong relationship with the persistence and the onset of knee tendonitis. And uh, we're going to get to an exercise to sort of help us in a second, but what I tend to find a lot clinically is this junction of your lower back. So where your rib cage meets your lower back, that sort of top section of the lower back, the base of the rib cage, the joints and the soft tissues in that section of the back, maybe that T12, L1, L2, L3 area, there tends to be a lot more stiffness and tightness in the joints and surrounding tissue of that area of the lower back. Now, this may sound strange because your back's over here potentially and your knees all the way over here, but there's some strong musculoskeletal and neural conne uh, connections between that section of your back and the knee. So uh, for those anatomy buffs out there, we know that the femoral nerve, <coughs> excuse me, comes from the, the upper reaches of that lower back, travels down through the front of the thigh, through the quads. And what I'm finding is if that lower back is stiff, tight and dysfunctional, whether it's neural tension or a mechanical compromise, we can basically change the way we're loading that tendon over time. So Clinically, what I'm finding is that uh, if you have a left-sided uh, knee tendonitis, probably 80 or 90% of the time, the left side of that mid to low lumbar spine, so the, the upper lumbar spine, the, the low thoracic spine, that thoracolumbar junction, uh, is often very stiff and tight in the same section on the same side. Now, in a small percentage of cases, the stiffness is on the other side, but the section or the segments of that spine that are dysfunctional um, are often... Uh, the same. So but more importantly, what I'm finding is when I free up and mobilize those stiff sections of the lower back, we can see uh, an immediate change in function and pain relating to that. Now, it's really important to acknowledge clearly that if you have knee tendonitis and that tendon has become dysfunctional, we know really well that there is some structural change and change to the matrix of that tendon uh, that makes it physically different to become painful. So it's unrealistic to expect that just by pushing on your back and freeing your back up, that that's magically going to change because those changes happen over a period of time of poor loading and dysfunction. However, what I'm finding is that by freeing up that section of the lower back and some of the, uh, the related components that, uh, that sort of flow onto the knee itself, we can start to change how painful it is and how much function that you have, which is leading me to think that you don't necessarily need that that sort of dysfunctional tendon to be perfect to regain that full function, maybe not full function, but to regain better function and for that pain uh, to change. Now, obviously, by restoring normal loading to that tendon, 
we would expect that over time that it would readapt to uh, back to something more interesting and something more uh, more correct, I guess, for want of a better term. But I really wanted to make a video highlighting that by freeing up sections of the lower back and the structures that follow on from that, you can you can start to control those symptoms a lot better. Maybe you don't have to keep taping the knee. Um, you know, obviously all the other treatments that we do in terms of eccentric loading through the tendon, you know, glute strength, calf stretching, hamstring stretching, quad stretching, all this sort of stuff is still really important. But I feel like we've missed the bigger picture for a long time. And one of the really interesting things that I see in a lot of people is that, uh, particularly with uh, knee tendonitis, is that sort of low, mid to low section of the back that becomes stiff, tight and overloaded. Um, often correlates with the exact position that we tend to, to sink through and slouch through when we're sitting. So another one of these hidden causes that I'm finding with patella tendonitis is that it may not actually be the repetitive, consistent load of um, you know, jumping and bounding and landing and twisting that creates or causes that tendon to become dysfunctional. It may actually be the stuff that we're doing when we're not being physically active. So if you're playing an hour of basketball, and that hour is sort of stirring up that tendon, we really want to look at what else you're doing throughout the day. So if you're sitting down studying a lot, if your posture sucks, if you sit on the couch playing Xbox, um, you know, PS5, um, you know, if you're on the computer a lot, if you have to work at a computer, whatever it might be, if you're in those bad spinal shapes for hours a day, creating that segmental dysfunction that might set up this tendon to become a problem, you then take that hidden dysfunction into your chosen activity, and it may never become a problem clearly, but for those who do, it seems to be enough to short circuit the normal loading and the normal function of that patella tendon, setting it up for a problem. So, so I've done a, a longer article on this that I'll link in the description, um, relating to Jager Amira, an Australian footballer, um, who ruptured his patella tendon, but had a history of uh, patella tendonitis along the way. Um, and if you want to sort of go into a little bit more detail about that, Please have a read of that. Um, it's, it's a year or two old now, but it's still really important in terms of what I've been finding over the years um, because I want to make sure that I can show you these two really quick exercises to give you something to take away from this video um, that can hopefully help you control your symptoms and change your symptoms far faster than I think we're probably doing at the moment. So, so the exercise itself, we've done this a lot before on the channel, but we just want to take a foam roller. We're going to put it into your lower back. We're going to try and free it up. Now you can use a tennis ball or a lacrosse ball, you can use whatever you need to do. <clears throat> but the one thing I always need to make clear with any foam roller exercise is I don't want you to roll. Um, I think because it's a foam roller, we get this false sense of security that we need to roll backwards and forwards to make tissue change. But because we're trying to find some segmental stiffness, so we're not right down the base of the spine, we're not mid back where your shoulder blade is, we're sort of in the middle at the base of that rib cage um, and a little bit lower towards the top section of the, the lumbar spine. Now, if you're one of these people that has this low back dysfunction, which I'm, I'm estimating is probably most people, then it's not gonna be hard for you to find the areas that feel stiff and tight and the appropriate areas. So what I want you to do is you can roll it around until you find the spot that feels a little bit stiff and tight. So for me, I'm gonna roll a little bit to the left just to bias that left side. And I've found a spot here that feels a bit stiff. All I'm going to do is stay here. Now, obviously, this position takes a lot of effort. So for me, I'm flexible enough uh, to hit my head on a plant. I'm flexible enough to, to have my chest on the, or my back on the ground, my hips up, <clears throat> and I can just gently drop my hips to, to provide that tension through the joint. For other people, you might need to have a pillow or two just to hold you up in that position. But again, the key to this exercise is that once you've found a spot that feels stiff, I need you to stay there. I need you to have that direct, constant pressure through those stiff spinal segments so that you can actually start to affect change in those areas. We're not rolling over the top, taking care of some of the soft tissue. <clears throat> Excuse me. We're really trying to spend some time on an area to allow that area to give and that rustiness to free up so that we can get some normal mobility back into those joints, allow the nerves to function better, and get this flow and effect of better function and better loading down to that patella tendon. So, all you need to do, again, is you're lying on this, you're moving it up and down until you find a spot. You can bias one side or the other, depending on where you feel you need it the most. And then you want to stay there for a minute, two minutes, whatever you feel it takes for that section to feel like it becomes less tender, less restricted. Once you've done that, then you just move it up a tiny bit or down a tiny bit, looking for the next segment involved. Now, I can almost guarantee, at least in the patients that I see, 
maybe because I'm looking for it, maybe because there's a really strong connection here. Either way, if you can free up those, uh, those stiff spinal segments, then retest how your knee feels. So before you do that exercise, maybe do some squats, do some stairs, do some hopping, walk around, do whatever you need to do that lets you know how your symptoms feel. Spend a good chunk of time on the ground watching television um, with your phone out, whatever you need to do, freeing up those segments and then do the same thing again. Reach, uh, retest your squats, retest your stairs, running, jumping, hopping, whatever it is that exacerbates the symptoms so that you can be very clear as to what has changed from doing that. And let me know in the comments below. I want to hear how you feel this particular exercise goes uh, because clinically um, it's the same thing that I would do. I get my patients to do a, a movement that irritates them. I'd lie them down. I'd free up those stiff segments. I'd get them back up again and reassess how it feels. And I would expect to see some initial improvement. Again, you can't cure it straight away because that dysfunctional tendon has become dysfunctional. But we can create a much better environment for that tendon to function in which can improve how you feel very, very quickly. So that's exercise number one. The second part of this is we want to go after a lot of the tightness that happens through the quads. And again, we love this stretch on the channel, the couch stretch. Um, the couch stretch basically can account for a lot of the segmental uh, muscular dysfunction that can happen if that nerve becomes tight or if it, if it asks the quads to become tight and basically pull some slack out of the, the thigh, pull some slack out of the knee having extra resting tension on that tendon isn't a good thing. So again, you've seen this a thousand times, but what we want to do is we want to get the affected leg back into the wall. We want to place the other leg up in sort of a higher position. Again, we want to keep your back straight. We're looking at ex uh, extending up through the hips. So we want to come up as tall as you feel comfortable. Um, the interesting thing about this exercise is the pressure itself isn't on the knee, it's above the kneecap. So this should be a comfortable position if you can get yourself into this position um, where the pressure's above the kneecap instead of just being directly down on top of it. But as I come up, I'm lucky that I'm flexible enough to be able to get up here really comfortably. It feels a little bit tight here, nothing too crazy. But for a lot of people, you might find that you won't be able to get to vertical straight away. You might have to hang out here for a minute or two um, or you know, uh, keep coming back to this for about a week or so and eventually you feel like you'll be able to make it up a little bit taller. Um, again, I'll link uh, to a couple of videos up here. There's a beginner's version of the couch stretch, which, which you can do on a chair or a couch, which is where the name comes from. And there's some more advanced techniques as well um, that involves a band and a step and things like that. They can really take your hip flexor and quad flexibility to the next level. But more importantly, we're doing it in the context of trying to feed some slack back into that, um, that patella tendon. Um, to create a better environment for that to function in. So, as I said, I want to reiterate that I don't want this to sound like the magical cure for your knee tendonitis is freeing up the back on its own. It can have a huge say in the trajectory and the speed of your rehab based on what I'm finding clinically, and it's missed a lot. Now, as I said, it doesn't, um, it's not a, an alternative thing to do instead of your eccentric stuff or your, your ankle um, joint mobility, your calf flexibility, your hamstring flexibility, your quad flexibility, your, your glute strength, your quad strength, all the stuff that we have told you to do or I'm sure you're doing um, as a good patient who sees a therapist or whoever it might be. It's not um, this or that. It's another thing to add into the mix to try and get everything to function better faster. Because if you're having consistent patella tendon issues, um, at least from what I see clinically, your back probably has a very strong say in that. And as I mentioned briefly before, your postural habits, the way you load up that section of your back, need to get better as well because everything happens for a reason physically. If something's sore, it's a signal that your body isn't tolerating something about the function of that area, not just the local spot, the function of everything. And if we're not taking a step back to figure out what that is, then we're missing the point. We can certainly make you feel better. We can manage you through this with tape and pain meds and things like that. But we're not here to manage you through things, at least on the channel. I want to make sure I give you guys some directions to how you can go out fixing and solving those issues. Again, based on the things that I'm finding clinically. So, so hopefully that really helps you guys. Let me know in the comments down below how you found those two stretches. Let me know your history. You know, how long have you had it for? What have you tried? What's worked? What hasn't worked? Um, and hopefully I can help sort of give you some general direction uh, in the comments below if you need it. So um, as always, if you found that really useful, please leave a like on the video, subscribe to the channel if you're new, um, 
obviously, hope, hopefully this video sort of is an example of the kind of content that we're putting out. Um, hopefully it's useful. Hopefully it sort of fills in a few gaps, maybe helps you find a few missing pieces of that pain puzzle that you have. Um, if you know someone who has patella tendonitis, let me know. Let them know, share the video to them, because I think this, this crucial aspect of knee tendonitis, the back's involvement is really underrated, if not completely overlooked, particularly because most people don't have a sore back. But with that being said, I hope that was really helpful and uh, I'll hopefully see you in the next one. Bye.